Thank you, Eddie. I appreciate so very much those very kind, too kind remarks that you've made. And I consider it a signal honor to be invited to be on this lectureship. I have always felt that there are at least a thousand preachers in Texas that could do a much better job than I could do on this program. But I suppose that every lectureship needs to have somebody on it from east of the Mississippi, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity of being here. This lectureship has gained the reputation throughout the Brotherhood of being at least one of the very finest lectureships conducted by our brethren each year. And I certainly would concur with that, although I'm a little bit reluctant to make comparisons. Sometimes they're a little dangerous. I'm reminded of a young fellow who came into the courthouse bringing a marriage license, and he asked the clerk, can I get the girl's name changed on this license? I found another one that I like a little bit better than I do this one. And she said, no, you'll just have to buy a new license. And he said, how much will that cost? And she said, $5. He thought for just a moment and then turned and walked out and was heard to say as he left, well, I just don't believe there's that much difference in those two girls. <laughs> <clears throat> we sometimes say that the work of the church is threefold, that it involves the matter of evangelization, edification, and benevolence, and that's true. We work in those three areas. But as Brother Whitten has pointed out so very clearly, the mission of the church is not threefold, but it is onefold. The mission of the church of the Lord is the salvation of the souls of men and women. Even the good works that Jesus did while he was upon earth were designed not primarily because of his concern for the material welfare of those people that he helped, but in order to confirm the fact that he was indeed the Son of God. In John 20, 30, and 31, the Bible says, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Our Lord performed the miracles that he performed in order to establish his identity as the Christ, the Son of God, and not primarily because of the fact that he wanted to feed those who were hungry, give sight to the blind, heal those who were lame, or raise the dead. He was interested in the salvation of souls. Now that's not to say that our Lord is not concerned with the material needs of people. It's not to say that he doesn't care about sick people. He doesn't care about those who are poor or those who are hungry, because he does. And I think that there's nothing more clearly taught in the Word of God than the fact that God is concerned about our material welfare. Psalm, 140, uh, Psalm 14 and 6 says that the Lord is the refuge of the poor. Psalm 36 and 5, 35 and 10 says that the Lord delivers the poor and the needy from him who would spoil them. Psalm 40 and 17 tells us that the Lord thinks upon the poor and needy. The law of Moses contains a number of different ordinances which show us God's concern about those who are poor, those who are needy. For example, if you were living under the law of Moses, some fellow came to you and wanted to borrow some money, and he pawned his coat or his bed to you. The law of Moses requires that before dark came each night, you would have to give it back to him. You wouldn't be allowed to keep it overnight because the Lord was concerned about those who were poor. He wouldn't want this man to have to sleep if he were cold, and so you'd have to give him his coat or his bed back before nighttime comes, according to Deuteronomy 24 and 13. One year in seven, the sabbatical year, the land was not to be worked. It was to be left lying out. And one of the reasons stated for that was simply because of the fact that the Lord wanted to take care of those who were poor, Exodus 23, verses 9 to 11. You're familiar with the fact that under the law of Moses, the Jews were not to gather the corners of their fields. 
And they were not to glean their fields. They were not to glean their vineyards. If they went through their wheat fields and uh, gathered up the wheat and some of it fell behind, they were forbidden to pick up that which they dropped. They couldn't gather all of it. And they couldn't go back and gather it again the second time. And it is specifically mentioned that the reason that they had to leave a part of their field was because of the fact that God was interested in those who were poor. Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10. And certainly we understand that many of the good deeds of our Lord prove that he was concerned about those who were poor and needy, though that was not the primary reason for his performing those good deeds. Matthew 14 says, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. He was moved with compassion. A leper came to Jesus and said, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus was moved with comp compassion, the Bible says. And he put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. Mark 1, 40 and 41. In Matthew 15 and 32, the Bible tells us that Jesus saw the multitude and that he had compassion upon them because they had nothing to eat. It was on this occasion. This is one of the occasions at least whenever the Lord fed the multitude, performed a miracle in order to do so. Jesus came into the city of Nain, or Nain, and he met a funeral procession. The only son of a widow had died. And the Bible tells us when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. And as a result of that compassion, of course, he raised that son from the dead. That's in Luke chapter 7. There's no question that our Lord is concerned about the welfare of people. In Luke chapter 10, the Bible tells us about the Good Samaritan. We've given him that name. He's not called the Good Samaritan in that chapter. But you're familiar with the story how that a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who beat him and robbed him and stripped him of his clothing and left him for dead. A priest and a Levite came by, and both of them saw the man, but neither one of them rendered any assistance to him. The Bible tells us that this Samaritan came along, and you'll notice that the Bible specifically says that when he saw him, he had compassion. The point that I'm trying to make is that the Bible emphasizes the fact that the people of God need to be a feeling people. We need to be a caring people. We must be a compassionate people. In Acts chapter 6, in connection with the selection of those men that we believe were what we call the very first deacons in the Lord's church, it was because of the fact that some of those people in the church at Jerusalem were being neglected. There needed to be something done to see to it that they were taken care of. I like the way that that was handled. The apostles said, select from among you seven men. You select the people. You people who feel that your people are being neglected, you select the man, and then whoever you select, we will appoint over this business. They were concerned. They were interested in the situation which had existed and which had caused the problem. When Paul and Barnabas went up to the uh, city of Jerusalem about the question of circumcision, one of the uh, thing, uh, th those who were pillars in the church at Jerusalem were careful to remind them of was that they remember the poor. And in Galatians chapter 2, the apostle Paul said, I was already forward to do that. Is it significant that of the things which we are told after they went up there, and this is probably the event in Acts chapter 15, one of the things that they were specifically told as they went preaching to the Gentiles was to remember the poor, be concerned about people who are less fortunate. In Matthew 25, the judgment scene gives us a picture of people who were on the right or who were on the left. And the thing in this particular picture of the judgment that determined whether one was on the right or on the left was whether or not he fed the hungry, whether or not he gave drink to the thirsty, whether he clothed the naked, whether he visited those in prison, and so forth. 
In other words, the Lord emphasizes the fact in this picture of the judgment that the people of God must be people concerned about the welfare of their fellow man. If you feel like that helping those who are in need is just a minor part of Christianity, there's a good chance you need to read the New Testament again and more carefully the next time because you will see if we're going to be like our Lord was and if we're going to be like those Christians in the first century, we're going to have to recognize a need for compassion upon our fellow man. But I want to make mention also of the fact that I believe there is a danger that sometimes our benevolent work may become too impersonal. We have our orphan homes to take care of orphan children. We have our homes for the aged to take care of the old people. And down at the church, they have a benevolent committee, and everybody knows who you're supposed to call if somebody's in need. And we pride ourselves in the fact that our contribution goes to support all of these good works. But I don't think there's anything wrong with those things. As a matter of fact, I really do believe that sometimes we need to be a little bit more organized, especially in connection with our benevolent work. But I wonder sometimes if we don't save our conscience and feel that we have no personal and individual responsibility in helping those who are in need simply because of the fact that we've got folks in the church who are designated to do that. And after all, I'm not even on the benevolent committee. Why should I worry about that sort of thing? We really do need to be like the Good Samaritan. We need to learn to be compassionate toward those who are in need. Well, how does benevolence become a door opener for evangelism? How can it be a tool for evangelism? Well, think of the law of Moses once again. We talked about the fact that God had given certain commandments under the law of Moses requiring the people to take care of those who were strangers, those who were poor, and those who were needy. When the law concerning the Sabbath day, for example, was given, those Jews understood that they were not to labor on the Sabbath day. They were not to do any work on the Sabbath day. Now, a person might get the impression, well, I have a servant in my household who is not a Jew, and this law does not apply to them, and so I won't do any work, but on that day my servant can go ahead and wait on me. I'll let him do the work. Oh, no. Because in giving that law in Exodus chapter 20, the Lord specifically specified that man and beast, and he then specified that also the stranger was to be subject to this law. This was God's way of letting the Jews know that they were to be considerate even of those who were strangers. The same thing was true concerning the sabbatical year, whenever they let the land lie out, whenever they did not work the land. It was specifically pointed out that the poor and the stranger would be able to harvest that, what, that grew of itself. They were to use that to eat. Now, if those Jews living under the law had been like some of my brethren, they may have reasoned this way. They may have said, well, you know, we didn't plant anything this year, and we didn't work the land, so we're not going to have much of a harvest. As a matter of fact, we'll probably just have barely enough to get by on ourselves, and so we better not try to help those who are strangers and those who are poor this year. No, God specifically mentioned that during that sabbatical year, the stranger would have the same access to that which grew of itself in the fields, as were the Jews themselves. And Israelite was made to recognize his duty and his responsibility toward, toward those who were poor and toward those who were strangers. In Leviticus 19, the law concerning the gleanings, that is, that which was dropped, that which was left in the field, the poor, and the Bible specifically mentions that the stranger could come and gather that. Think of it. If you were a Jew and you owned a field and you harvested that field, you had no legal right under God's law to tell any man, even though he might be a foreigner, that he could not go into that field. Anybody who was poor and wanted to go into that field and gather what had been left behind had the right to do so, and you had no right to keep him from it. That was God's way of showing people his concern for all people. And the fact that it specifically mentions the stranger, I think, shows that God was trying to get the message across to the Jews that he, God, was concerned about the welfare of all people and not 
the Jews only. Now, can you imagine what effect this law would have had on the nations of the world if the Jews had been faithful to that? If the Jews had been faithful in taking care of the stranger, the poor, and the needy, even though they were not Jews, can you imagine what, it, what effect it would have had on all of the nations of the world? But they were not faithful to it. You remember in Matthew 23 and 23, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you do pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the, of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Did you see that? Mercy. Our Lord calls mercy one of the weightier matters of the law. And he said that those Jews had neglected that. Now what was the result of it? In Romans chapter 2, the Apostle Paul tells us something about the result, the result of it. Verses 23 and 24. He said the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you Jews. Not just because of the fact that they had neglected helping those who were poor and those who were strangers, but because of their general attitude of apathy and indifference and even rebellion against God's law. But if they had remained faithful to it, the very opposite would have been true and they would have been a great light for the people around about them. Now look at some of the examples from the New Testament. Examples of benevolent work and the effect that it had in the saving of souls. And remember now, the saving of souls is the mission of the church. Everything that we do in the church is supposed to result eventually in something that will cause people to be saved, to go to heaven in the after, after a while. Concerning the early church, Luke wrote, And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need, Acts 2, 44 and 45. Is it any wonder then that we read just two verses later that these early Christians had favor with all of the people? Here they are selling their goods, parting them to all men, and the Bible says they had favor with all of the people. In Acts 4, 32, beginning, the Bible says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution were made unto every man according as he had need. Now then look at verses 13 and 14 of the very next chapter. These verses tell us that the people magnified them and that multitudes of believers, both men and women, were added to the Lord. What do you suppose would be the result in the church in Fort Worth and all of Texas and even over in Alabama today, if we would practice that same thing? Do you suppose that multitude of men and of women would also become believers as a result of that kind of an attitude? In Acts 11, 29 and 30, the Bible says, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it unto the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now then, in the very next chapter, in the very same paragraph where it tells us about the return of Barnabas and Saul from Jerusalem when they had taken this contribution up there, the Bible says the Word of God grew and multiplied. Are you surprised at that? Why, this is no doubt one of the reasons why the Word of God grew and multiplied. In 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, we have a lengthy and a very beautiful discussion of the matter of a contribution which was made by the Gentile churches for the saints which were in Judea, or as the Bible puts it, for the poor among the saints in Judea. This was benevolent work. And in connection with this benevolent work in which so many people, especially so many of the Gentile churches, were involved, the Apostle Paul wrote in verse 14 of chapter 9 that as a result of this benevolent work, some people were caused to glorify God. 
Does that remind you of something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 when he was talking to those who would be members of the church when the church was established? And he said, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, so that it giveth light to all that are in the house. Now watch it. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Can you think of any reason why people wouldn't be caused to glorify our Father in heaven, just like Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, that people glorified the Father in heaven, if we would engage in the very same kind of benevolent work that those people engaged in, I really think that we're overlooking a great opportunity by failure to engage in benevolent work. But I want to talk just a moment about benevolent work to the saints only. Of course, as you know, there are some who several years ago came up with the idea that the benevolent work of the church is to be limited to the saints. One man signed and debated a proposition which said, the scriptures teach that it is a sin to take money out of the church treasury to buy food for hungry, destitute children, and those who do so will go to hell. Now, a number of preachers who agreed exactly with what this man who signed the proposition, believed, will say that that was a ridiculous proposition, a silly proposition, implying that they don't really believe that. And maybe they don't, but I'll tell you what. You word the proposition this way and see how many of them will deny it. The Scriptures teach that it is a sin to take money out of the church treasury to buy food for hungry, destitute children who are not members of the church. And those who do so will go to hell. Now, you can't get them to, to deny that. The only reason that they say it's silly is because they believe the church can buy food for hungry, destitute children who are church members. It's still the doctrine of saints only. That the church cannot, cannot help any except those who are saints in a benevolent way. Now, of course, I realize that what we've learned from the Old Testament about the fact that the people of God's helping strangers does not prove that the church of our Lord is to help those who are not members of the church. I realize that. But I'd like for you to think with me for just a minute. Is it a fact that the reason God, under the law of Moses, gave command that the poor people among the strangers were to be objects of the pity and the care and the concern and the compassion of His people was in order that all of the people of the world might come to glorify the Father in heaven? Are we right in saying that? Well, now, if that's the case, then what about benevolence under the New Testament? Why, if this doctrine of benevolence for saints only is true, then benevolent work could never be a door opener to evangelism. As a matter of fact, it would have the very opposite effect. Do you know of any organization that engages in benevolent work that limits its benevolent work to the members of that organization? The denominational churches do not do so. For well, they help everybody that they have an opportunity to. Even the civic organizations do not limit their benevolent work to their own members. For example... Over where I live, the Lions Club is pretty strong, and around Christmas time, they del deliver food baskets to poor and indigent people. They buy glasses for people who are poor and who need glasses. They uh, help people who are in need. I don't know if they do it out here or not, but let's suppose that there's a Lions Club here in your community, and the news gets around that they won't buy glasses for anybody except people who are members of the Lions Club. They won't buy fruit baskets or grocery baskets at Christmas time for anybody who's not a member of the Lions Club. 
what kind of respect would the Lions Club in that manner maintain for itself? Why did it lose the respect of the community? But that's the very position that some of my brethren believe that the church of the Lord ought to occupy. That's completely foreign, completely opposite to what the Bible teaches, and I think teaches quite clearly in relation to this particular matter. For example, in Galatians 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia. In Galatians 6 and 10, the Apostle said, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Paul, what would you say? I said, let's do good to all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Do good to whom? To all men. Paul, who are you writing to? To the churches of Galatia. What are those churches to do? They're to do good to all men. Who's to do good to all men? The churches of Galatia. Who are those churches to do good to? All men. Now question. Did the churches of Galatia sin if they did what Paul told the churches of Galatia to do? Or did they sin if they refused to do what Paul told the churches of Galatia to do. James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now I realize that this is not the sum total of pure religion, but this at least gives us one definition of pure religion. It tells us what is involved in pure religion. What does it say? It says, Visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Somebody said, Oh, but that's written to the individual. Well, I doubt that it could be proved that that was written exclusively to the individual. But now what I'm saying is that that's beside the point. The point is here is a passage which tells us something that's involved in pure religion. Now I want to know, can the Lord's church practice pure religion? Or does the Lord's church sin if it does practice pure religion? Does a church sin if it practices pure religion or does it sin if it refuses to practice pure religion? Is pure religion visiting the fatherless and the widows to the individual but not visiting the fatherless and the widows to the church? Is pure religion one thing to the individual and the very direct opposite of that to the church? Well, it seems to me that to ask the question would certainly answer that question. Our Lord said in Matthew 5 and 43, Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemy. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Does that sound like the saints only doctrine? Now he said, if you'll do so, you'll be the children of your Father in heaven because he sends his, makes his sun to shine on the evil and on the good, sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. Well, he said, if you salute your brethren only, you're no better than the publicans. Our Lord said that those who saluted their brethren only, who do good to their brethren only, are no better than the Pharisees thought the publicans were. Now question, can the church do what the Lord taught in the Sermon on the Mount? Does the church sin if it does what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount? Or does the church sin if it refuses to do what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount? According to some of my brethren, the church sins if it does what Jesus did, uh, what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if it is a fact that compassion and a benevolent spirit on the part of God's people causes people to see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And I think we've seen tonight that certainly such is the case. Should we be surprised that a number of these congregations made up of people, or at least under the leadership of those who believe the saints-only theory, have over the years swindled 
uh, or, or dwindled and shriveled up, gotten smaller and smaller. Maybe swindle's a good word. I don't know. <laughs> Should we be surprised at that? Why, it's no wonder. When the Bible clearly teaches that evangelism is indeed a door opener to evangel, uh, uh, that benevolence is a door opener to evangelism. But then sometimes I wonder, do we practice what they preach? Oh, I know there are a number of people who are worthless and who are shiftless and who are lazy, and I know that there are people who go from church to church and who will lie and who will beg and get churches to contribute to them. I think that there are some people who are professionals at that. I know that there are some who are. And I know that it's not always easy to know who's worthy and who's not. But maybe sometimes we make too big an issue out of it. It may be that the priest and the Levite in Luke chapter 10 did not help the man who had been beaten and robbed by the thieves because they just wasn't sure that he was worthy of their help. After all, why was he in that mess to start with? And there's no indication that when the good Samaritan came along that he decided to conduct a full-scale investigation to determine whether this man was worthy of his help. Now, once again, I'm not saying that we ought to throw the Lord's money away on every shiftless, lazy rascal that comes along and wants some help. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that we need to recognize that the benevolent work that we do, though it should grow out of our compassion and our concern for those who are lost, is not primarily to help that fellow who's lost, but to try to open the door to cause people to glorify God. And I don't mean by that, that by helping this fellow who's lost, we might be able to evangelize him. That's not what I'm talking about. We might be, but that's not, that's not what we're discussing. We're discussing the matter that if we are the compassionate people, the caring people, the concerned people, people who reach out to help those who are in need, even those who are strangers, and if we have that kind of reputation in our several communities, it will result in people's being led to glorify God. It will open doors and permit us to have the opportunity of helping people. I'll tell you this. There are a number of people in this world who hate the church of the Lord with a passion. You've got some people live around here like that and in your community like that, I'm sure. And we have over in Alabama. But you show me a church that's true to God's word and that really practices what the Bible teaches with reference to benevolence. And though there are some people who will hate that church with a passion, they will respect it. That's right. They'll respect it. And that's the way that we can open doors. We need to realize then that we help people not merely to help them, but because benevolent work is a way to open the door for evangelism. Well, I know we'll make some mistakes. We'll help some people who are not worthy of help. And maybe we'll even fail to help some who really should have been helped. Well, what I'd like to urge is that let us make up our minds that when we make mistakes, those mistakes will be on the side of mercy. In other words, here's some worthless rascal that comes along. And so far as I'm able to determine, he has a legitimate need and he's really worthy of our help. And I'm on the benevolent committee and you're on the benevolent committee and we get together and he's pulled the wool over our eyes and, and we give him some help. Lo and behold, we later learn that he was a rascal. And we're going to have to give an account to God in judgment of throwing the Lord's money away, right? I don't believe so. He's going to have to give an account to God in judgment. We did the best that we knew to do under the circumstances. If I'm going to make a mistake, I want to make that kind of mistake. 
instead of the kind of mistake where some fellow comes along and I'm just not absolutely sure that he's worthy of help, and so I refuse to help him. And then later on, I learn that he was both worthy and desperately in need of my help, and I made a mistake. I refuse to be of help to him. Hebrews 13 and 2 says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. May God bless you. Now, that's the end of my speech. But I want to make an explanation. I'm going to have to miss Brother Frank Dunn's speech. Brother Dunn, I hate to miss it. But I'd rather miss it than to miss my plane, which is going, which is going to be leaving in 35 minutes from right now. So I'm going to be walking out this door, and it's been a joy to be with you. Thank you so much.